Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, good morning. I'm Whitney Diver McAvoy, the President and CEO of the Yonville Chamber of Commerce. And you are here at our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion webinar with Tari Laws Phillips. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, Tari has a wonderful presentation planned. And I know many of you joined us for our first uh, DEI panel that we had last month. So, so nice to see many of our familiar faces again. And um, this meeting is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you have friends that you'd like to share this with, uh, you can access it there uh, probably later today or tomorrow. So we'll also send it out in the e-news tomorrow. So um, I'll just give a quick intro of Tari and then I'll let her take it over. So um, I know many of you have uh, met Tari already via Zoom, but uh, Tari teaches improv at Cold Town um, in um, Texas, and of course, does many, many other things, which I will not even pretend to list them all or know them all because she um, is a woman that has a lot on her plate and is really helping a lot of folks uh, navigate the diversity, equity, inclusion space. And we are very grateful for her time that she shares with us today. Um, so she's the co-creator and facilitator of Cold Town's Unconscious Bias and Inclusivity Training, uh, which utilizes improv and emotional intelligence strategies to create supportive environments where people feel free to be their full and whole selves at work and everywhere else, which gives me the chills and is something that we all need to incorporate more in our lives. So Tari, thank you so much for being here today and I'll turn it over to you and you should be able to share your screen, but just let me know if there are any issues with that. Hello, uh, yeah, it says that it's disabled. Um, <laughs> hello and good morning to everyone in beautiful Yonville. Um, I can happily say I have visited and am happy to move anytime. I can talk my husband into it. Um, your weather is significantly better than here in Austin, Texas, and I am salty about it. Um, <laughs> I am... Um, to give you, nope, there it is. Okay, Woo, can everybody see my screen? Thumbs up, awesome. Uh, so a little about me, I don't know why I put a picture of myself on my own presentation, but uh, maybe it's for my ego. Um, I am, uh, yes, an improviser. I own a theater here in Austin, Texas. I'm also a marketer by career choice. Um, I'm currently a, a marketing mentor for a business accelerator, and I, I'm either doing diversity stuff or marketing stuff or the combination of the two all the time. Um, so it is what I love to do, and I'm so happy to be talking about it with you today. Um, first, I'd love to set the intention that this is a safe space. Um, this workshop is a space where we can ask any of those questions. Don't have fear about your word choice or um, sort of like things that might feel icky or fear. Um, let's extend the assumption of positive intent, meaning that you're here because you're curious, you're here because you want to learn. And uh, don't worry, uh, we're not gonna judge each other for like the questions that we have. Instead, we're just going to try to help each other. With that also, uh, feel free to stop me and ask questions during it. Because I'm an improviser, you can't get me too far off track. Um, you can ask me anything. Uh, the good news is, is that I'm here to help, so you can't offend me with your questions. I might look at you crossways or sideways and be like, where did that come from? But I promise that my response will come from a place of love and the want to be uh, sharing in my opinion. Also with that, diversity is a, um, an emerging part of education and paradigms are shifting all the time. I don't proclaim to know everything. So if you hear me say something and you're like, she's full of crap, um, I hope I'm not. And uh, let's debate if you think that I am. No, like a healthy chatter, not a debate. Um, also, if you're like, wow, she's making a bunch of jokes. I told you I was an improviser. That means I'm a comedian. But what we're talking about is serious. It's just that I think it can be fun to talk about. So first things first, let's have a little gut check. <laughs> you're here because you want to show that change. You want to show change. And that's really good. Change will be more organic within your workspaces and within your brands and your businesses if you are actually doing the personal work internally. 
and as either as a team or as individuals. That means there may be more for you to do outside of workshops that includes like learning how to be an ally, doing the research on learning more about different people and simply like checking your own unconscious bias. We're not really talking about that today, but if you have questions about it, I'm happy to jump in. Recognize that the work you're trying to do is impactful and a part of a huge societal change. So with that, that's saying, listen, fatigue is real. Everybody gets sort of irritated when things aren't changing as fast as we want them to, but the work you're doing is a part of us all changing as a society. That's also because in the last year, I've had lots of meetings where people are like, we've been talking about Black Lives Matter for six months, Tari, and I don't understand why everybody's not on board. And my response is usually, some of us have been talking about it for 400 years. So it's okay <laughs> if you're frustrated after six months. Your frustration comes out of that want for change. And sometimes you just gotta take a moment, take a deep breath, recalibrate and recognize that everybody's small steps help us to make big, big steps together. Okay, so a uh, quick note up top, diversity comes in a number of dimensions. For what we're talking about today, I'm talking about all of these dimensions. And that's why I also say that it's an ongoing place of work is because oftentimes we're like, okay, I got a black person in that ad, we're done, we're super diverse. And it's like, wait, <laughs> there's so many other ethnicities you haven't spoken of that doesn't speak to people of different genders. It doesn't speak to different sexualities. It doesn't speak to class or religion or disabilities or neurodivergence or age or, 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 or. So there's always more work to be done. And that's why we have to be cognizant of it and consistently working toward it. So to start with diversifying your social media. What's appropriate for my brand should be the first question you ask of yourself. One thing you might do is audit other like brands to see what they're doing. Audit your aspirational brands. Uh, no matter where you are in the life of your business or brand, there might be businesses that you see as aspirational to you. There also might be brands that you see as um, brands that are much like you or have the same audience. For instance, I'm a car person. I always like to sort of categorize a type of business by the car. I think those people drive, right? Um, so uh, let me think of anybody throw me a brand. Everybody's on mute. I know you are because y'all are in a place where you don't want me to be loud and you don't want to be loud. Gabriella. What was the question again? A car? Yeah, throw, or any brand and I'll tell you what car I would sort of like Tesla, just because I just saw one drive by. <laughs> so I always sort of categorize a Tesla driver as like a Whole Foods shopper um, because there's a whole line of them at my at my Whole Foods. So there, I think of them as like a Whole Foods shopper. I think of them as being like in yoga pants or athleisure. So I think of them as like a Nike person or a New Balance person, maybe a Lululemon. Um, I think of them as like, they're going to spend a lot on water, even when it's free from a tap, you know, those sorts of things, right? So if you are, hint water, then maybe, and you see yourself as being a part of that brand selection, maybe you stop to see what other, what those other brands have did, done on social media about social justice. Have they said anything? Have, have they, have they posted Stop Asian Hate? Have they posted Black Lives Matter? Have they just sort of like diversified the pictures that you see? Are they being explicit about Pride Month or not? That'll give you an idea of how they feel, especially if you're a smaller brand and you don't have all the money to dump into brand intelligence and going and running $200,000 brand insight reports through agencies. We can glean a lot from the PepsiCo's of the world by what it is that they're doing online. And I promise they're spending all of that money in brand intel intelligence. You can get an idea of what's appropriate for like brands. Now that doesn't diminish your voice online. It just maybe changes how you choose to speak out. Here's three questions I want you to ask yourself and ask of your brand before you make, uh, make moves on social media. 
I want you to think about the space. Where in the conversation about DEI or Black Lives Matter or systemic inequity, does it make sense for your company to weigh in? Where? Is it on your social media? Is it on your website? Is it within social media? Are you doing it on your Instagram or your LinkedIn? What makes sense for your brand? If you are a particularly, uh, if you are a brand that speaks B2B, maybe your LinkedIn makes sense. If you're looking to bring in more new hires that are diverse, maybe it makes sense to do it on LinkedIn. If you're not really hiring anytime soon because uh, you don't have any money for new acquisitions, then maybe you just want to speak in social media. Maybe it's on your Facebook, maybe it's in your LinkedIn, but be cognizant of what messaging is appropriate for that space. The value. What questions does your audience have about this space about DEI, about diversity and equity that you could actually be helpful on? Do you have any valuable web like insight on that? So if you if you have a brand, if you sell water, <laughs> what does the world need to hear from you? I assume there's nobody that sells water here, is there? Okay, well, I've worked on a couple of water brands, so I won't divulge any secrets. But if you sell water, what are you, what what do I trust my water to tell me about diversity? Is this water company? Do they have anything to tell me that makes them an expert? No, I might not be looking to them for legal advice on uh, the latest uh, Supreme Court cases because I I just want to drink water, right? But I might be interested in knowing that they do support social justice issues. It might be that they uh, they are particularly uh, ingrained in healthful education. That might be a place where they can talk to me about how to ensure that clean water is available to schools across the country. That makes sense. So they can be uh, much more influential in a space where there's some perceived uh, credibility in what they're talking about. But also just knowing that they support something could also be helpful as long as it's not tokenizing, which we'll definitely talk about in a moment. And then the last is what kind of support does the brand's community need from us? What are they looking for from us? Can you be a resource and in what ways can you be a resource? Oh, I will say also the way that I see this is if anybody's dropping anything in the comments, I can't necessarily see it. So somebody uh, yell at me and be like, hey, Tari, we've got a question because I can't see both. So one thing I will say is that within your social media, you can be explicit or implicit about diversity. And this is what I mean by that. Explicit diversity is going to be that you are casting diverse imagery of everybody, but you also have an explicit message about diversity. Brands can be sometimes scared to be explicit about that message of diversity, right? There's always somebody that's just not sure. And that's okay. I'm not going to fault you <laughs> for those conversations because there may be somebody internally that's like, I don't know, guys, we're scared. We're scared somebody's going to have something bad to say. It may happen. You got to deal with it when it does. We'll talk about how to deal with it. But sometimes you're going to say something that is, you know, very specific. Now, the example I have here is from McBride Sisters, which is a winery. And they're Black women. So they get to talk about Black women's issues with some credibility. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense for their audience. They're very explicit in what this is. It literally says why black women's equal payday matters. That's it, you couldn't get more explicit. A more subtle way to be diverse is the next um, example, this implied diversity where it's simply showing a woman who is different than their audience maybe, and showing that they are inclusive of different types of women. So it's a more implicit way. That's sort of that, let's find somebody who, with a face that doesn't look like everybody else's and let's show that they are a part of the community we care about. 
I'm talking fast, y'all, but don't forget to stop me if you have questions. I have a quick question. Yeah. So um, one thing that I have kind of heard about when it comes to trying to be inclusive and show these things on social media is virtue signaling. Um, so kind of saying, hey, we care, but then your company doesn't really back it up. You know, it's all talk. Um, so I was just kind of curious as to what your opinion is on that and kind of how you can help avoid that. You know, I, I don't know if I can do too much right now with my company, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, um, but I'm just kind of curious as to, you know, how to seem genuine, you know, uh, we're starting to have a bigger social media presence and I want to, you know, kind of show things that way, but I, I'm afraid that it might be called that basically. <laughs> well, I think um, the one thing I say is to always be truthful <laughs> and to uh, like really be heart led when you make the decisions. So um, showing imagery of people is very important. But if it's your first step, I also suggest that maybe more than you takes workshops next time. And it's, hey guys, we got to do some of the internal work so that we're making the decisions externally. We're not just showing something that isn't true for us and our brand. The other thing I would say is to make sure you're not tokenizing and to really be uh, giving credit where credit's due, to be paying influencers and people for their work. Oftentimes, uh, for a long time, we, uh, those of us with scrappy budgets promised exposure in, a, in exchange for work. And now there's a real movement to, that literally is explicit about paying creators and creators of color for their work. Last year, when the paradigm started to shift, black content creators, people of color content creators, Asian content creators all got a ton of outreach and a lot of times that was for in exchange for exposure. And the understanding was that you want me to do work for you because you need a diversity show. You need to pay me for my mind work. The one thing I'll, and I'll uh, touch back on this later in the presentation is set a, like a set price and be transparent about that set price. If you have this many, this many followers, this is what we're willing to pay. If you have this many followers, this is what we're willing to pay. And this is consistent across every one of, every one of our influencers, no matter what it is that they look like. We can negotiate from there up or down, but this is our base set price. And having that transparency at least provides some understanding that I'm not being tokenized. Thank you so much. That was really helpful. I appreciate it. Um, it's good to think of, but also I would say like, oftentimes that's the pushback that can happen internally. Um, and it might feel gross when you hear it from someone. It's also okay to call them on that and be like, hey, <laughs> one, it's expected. At this point, diversity is expected from Gen Z, millennials, Gen X. It's expected. And when it's not there, people are recognizing it. And so you have to be on the train of at least doing the outward show, but attempt to do the internal work. Absolutely. That, that was really good context. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Here's a little bit of what it looks like to prioritize representation. A lot of brands now, you'll see in this Ralph Lauren ad, I chose Ralph Lauren because it is a luxury brand. Um, it may be ubiquitous and it's literally everywhere, but it is a luxury brand. They pretty much, if you go through their social media feed, there is a person of color for every three images that you see. And I think that's a great example. They've essentially said, we're going to make sure that if you are scrolling, you're going to see people of color often. Another great example, uh, if you look up the Visit uh, Boston, that's a CBB. They've got a program going on that's all-inclusive Boston. And so when you go through their social media feed, you see it. Things like pride, right now it's pride. You should be seeing pride representation and LGBTQ representation all over the place. And I'm sure that you do. This is another one of those places where there's a lot of chatter also about not tokenizing 
and continuing that representation outside of Pride Weeks. This is also one of those places where you may, uh, uh, one of the things I suggest is you have a feedback loop. You have to decide how you're gonna deal with that feedback when you post Pride imagery and uh, representation in the LGBTQ because the social media warriors are out there and they are, they can't wait to have something to say. Come on, there it is. So there's a couple of uh, ground rules when you are diversifying your social media, your timing, be quick to comment and be, uh, be really timely on what you're posting. Recognize that if you miss the boat, it's okay to let the moment pass. That's better than being super late to the party. So if a, uh, if a cataclysmic large event happens in our society and you don't make a response within a couple of days, let it go. <laughs> it's much better than 10 days later being like, oh, hey, everybody, um, something bad happened in Atlanta. Uh, it's been two months, but uh, just to let you know, we decided to say uh, stop Asian hate. That's probably gonna draw more attention negatively than if you simply let the boat pass and do the work internally. Give credit to all of your content creators. If you're borrowing imagery, if uh, somebody posts something that you think is awesome, reach out to them and ask, hey, this is really cool. Can we repost and give you credit? Seek creators who are diverse. Set that in your mind. Hey, you know what? We're working with five people this month. I would really like to see imagery or content from three people who are women, who are people of color. We haven't posted anything from anyone who is South Asian um, at any point. I need to look for creators and content creators and partners who are South Asian. And then pay for play. That's that equal pay structure and really ensuring that sometimes that's going to soften your outreach. I oftentimes do that where I literally say, hey, I'm working on behalf of such and such brand. We wanna inc increase our diversity. I'm looking for partners who are South Asian and this is my equity pay scale. We pay everyone this. And that lets people know that I'm not looking to tokenize you. I'm looking for long-term relationships. And I'm also attempting to create a paid relationship where I recognize your talent and recognize it with actual pay. Now that may be $50 if that's what your budget is, but I would suggest you look for some opportunity to pay some small amount. And then all of you have some amazing thing you can gift. Everybody likes free stuff. <laughs> and then enlist. Utilize the fans and followers that you have now. Look for ways that you can literally go through your likes. And if you start to see the same people liking often, and they are, they give you some diversity, reach out. Hey, I saw that you like a lot of our stuff. Are you a big fan? We'd love to send you a gift. Would you mind posting about it? That should only cost you shipping and posting and cost of goods. And that little bit of love can make a fan an advocate. If you aren't sending them something, it could just be liking one of their pictures or writing a comment. That goes a super long way. That's huge recognition for anyone. Uh, and with that, I always, I like to use the litmus test of like, would it make your mom happy? If it would make your mom happy, it would totally make a, a follower happy. So, you know, everybody's excited when, um, if your mother's on Facebook, like my mother is, if I comment on something of hers, she's like, oh, you commented, you saw my Facebook post. That's all it really takes to really draw people in. Any questions as I'm rolling through? Good. So thinking about partnerships, partnerships are gonna allow you a really great opportunity to dig into a diverse network, um, both internally and customer facing. So the way that I think of that is internally, can you create partnerships that allow you to diversify the network that you have for your company before you can, uh, before you're making employee decisions or hiring decisions. Oftentimes uh, I work with brands who are like, well, we, we're trying to hire, but we can't get anybody into the funnel and that is diverse. Well, then my response is usually like, 
check with your network. Well, there's nobody that is diverse in our network. So let's start to work from both ways. If you have partners who are diverse, then those are the people you can reach out to. Even if that's, if that's your plumber, your plumbers, you're not your plumber's only business. Uh, you know, you're not your, uh, your rental company's only business, the flower uh, company that you work with, you're not the only business they work with. Those could be the people that start to create your more diverse network. But more importantly, if it's your uh, content creators reaching out to them, they work with other brands, they might know somebody really great. If it is uh, other brands or like businesses that you've worked with, it could be them. So when you're looking to fill your diversity funnel, your partners are a huge part of that. And from a marketing standpoint, it's a huge part of it as well, because that's oftentimes going to be the easiest people to reach out to, to diversify your feeds um, in social media. So look for the organic partners. That's going to be businesses who are sort of the organic extension of your audience. Remember that hint in Tesla uh, conversation we had earlier? If you think of all of the things that your perfect customer is using, all of those are possible extensions and partnership opportunities. It's businesses who complement yours. One of the most interesting ones that uh, I've seen recently is a bath and body care company that worked with a, that they're a luxury body care company. I, I think I have some slides from them later, but they worked with a luxury food delivery service. And I was like, Girl, what <laughs> was the conversation I had with when I was uh, told by the founder? And she's like, no, it's the most uh, successful partnership she's had to date because it was unexpected for the consumer, but it made total sense. And there was zero overlap in the people that they were already reaching from, say, their email marketing. But it was very complimentary. And then embrace that feedback. So create a feedback loop and em embrace it and re recognize that you're going to have to respond to criticism in some way, or you could let your followers do it if you have loyal brand advocates, but you have to do that honestly. And we'll talk about that a little more too, unless there's a question. <laughs> and then um, look for diverse companies. So this is a great place where it's look for founders and companies owned by diverse owners. Their founders are of diverse backgrounds. This is a great chance to gain some of their loyal following. And then also diverse, diversity in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. So that's, if you are doing a photo shoot and you have a diverse model, well, maybe have a diverse hairdresser, have a diverse, you know, producer, looking for people outside of the just the norm, uh, people that you've always worked with, all of those are opportunities for diversity. And that's finding, that's increasing the equity through all parts of a project. And then having equitable deals. So that's again, avoiding that tokenism and creating deals that offer growth and equal exchange for all of the partners involved. And then sharing content and customer details is going to be super important. Do I see a, a chat there? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, now I have to get rid of that little, sorry, y'all. Um, here's an example. This is that uh, beauty, that luxury body care company I was telling you about, Esther Beauty. They have, their number one goal has been to, this is a brand I mentor, their goal has been to consistently grow their email list because they recognize that that's the cheapest way for them to get people to make a buying decision. It's their most cost-effective channel is direct to consumer. They about monthly create a partnership with different types of business businesses to do a giveaway. And those giveaways are always driven by wanting to grow their email list. This one is Esker Body Products. They make body oils and um, bath salts connected to a nightgown company, an herbal sleep tincture and CBD tincture, and a sleep psychologist. The sleep psychologist, you can't really see in her picture, is um, South Asian. 
So they were seeking to sort of make a connection with brands that are owned by one of her things is making sure every one of her giveaways includes a founder who is of a diverse background. You'll see that, well, you can't see here, but Esther has approximately 15,000 followers. So she has brands that are around the same. They're a little bit smaller than her, but they have zero overlap. So one has 10,000 followers, one has 7,000 followers, and one is much smaller with 14,000 followers. But for her, all of those people are brands that she doesn't have overlap for. And so it gives her essentially the opportunity to gain her followers by another 20,000 people from a campaign that really is just her social media posts and a giveaway. Now, when I say uh, responding and recognizing, here's an example of that. This is Jenny Kane, which is an in um, a women's wear brand that also has home goods. They've worked to really diversify their feeds. They're another one that has decided on that um, one for three rule where every three pictures they post, one includes, or actually every three models that they post, one of them is a person of color. And they posted this beautiful imagery of a ceramicist. And you'll see that people will uh, add a comment that has nothing to do <laughs> with it, nothing to do with this beautiful ceramicist. Someone wrote that their customer service is horrible. They placed an order, they couldn't get a response. They were doing tracking, da 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 da. Jenny Kane is the first reply. Please DM us. Now, I would probably hope that they would be a little more caring in their response. Oh no, we're so sorry you're having a problem, but they're responding quickly. And then they are involved in the conversation. So this also gives them the opportunity that anyone else who sees this post, which is liked by over 500 people, is going to see that they are on top of it and responsive. Here's another example, because they're a brand who is a luxury women's wear brand, who's decided to be explicit about uh, their views on social justice. They posted about Stop Asian Hate. They also simply posted on election day, or I'm sorry, on inauguration day, a picture of the um, vice president. They got a ton of response. So this is an example of like everything blew up for them on inauguration day. They averaged um, about a thousand likes on each picture. This one had 17,000 likes via uh, as of yesterday and something like 1500 responses. I monitored their responses the whole inauguration day because a lot of people were immediately unfollowing, saying that they're an ex-buyer, saying I can't believe you posted her. Consumers were getting in fights in the comments and they made the decision that they that they had simply posted a simple picture and that they felt like it was worth celebrating the, our first female vice president and that they were going to allow their consumers to be their voice. And it worked for them. They also had a high, one of their highest sales days of Q1 as a result of this. Because what happened was all of the people who said, I'm never gonna shop you again, I'm unfollowing, da 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 da. Of the 17,000 people who saw this, lots of people went and made a buying decision as a result. And they got lots of messages that were like, hey, I purchased today and I purchased because I saw that and I want to let you know that I'm glad you posted that. That was a big deal. There were lots of internal meetings. I ended up on a really good emergency call and lots of other people did. And internally there were conversations like, should we pull it? And that's where you have to decide what your goal is going to be, but also what your plan's going to be if this is the result that you get. Any questions there? Okay. I like to give that example because uh, their CEO freaked out. Um, <laughs> and she is uh, very much an ally and they do a lot of the work internally and personally, but ultimately we're all still businesses with bottom lines. And nobody wants to have a terrible day of sales as a result of celebrating the vice president. So when you think of paid, earned and shared media, these are the places that you can think of those things. 
And earned media is great. It's free and everybody always wants it because it is free, but recognize that you don't have any control when it comes to it. You can hope all day. Uh, earned media is oftentimes social, um, I'm sorry, not social, but PR. And it's things like reviews, it's backlinks, it's press coverage. A lot of that you're hoping to get, you're doing the work, but hoping that it gets seen by anyone. Paid media, you have the control, but it's uh, credibility is also um, sometimes in question. <laughs> so when uh, consumers see sponsored, are they going to recognize that, see it as authentic is oftentimes the issue. Owned media, what happens on your site, what happens on your blog, what happens in your social media, you get lots of control, um, but oftentimes you're paying for that too. If not implicitly with the uh, websites, you're paying for the people to do it, you're paying for the content and so on and so forth. And then shared media is what you hope you get out of owned media is that it's shareable and something that people want to continue to sort of use. When you're looking at increasing your diversity, your earned media and your shared media are the big opportunities there. And so for you, you really have to be looking at, can we create content that people care to share? And that uh, can we create opportunities for stories that people care to share? And that's the big thing. Um, I have a couple of things with PR. Um, reach out and offer. Look for those places where you can be of service um, if you have a beautiful space, which I mean, give me a break, every space in Knoxville is gorgeous. You have space that you could simply offer. Could you offer it to local organizations at a reduced rate or even no rate when you simply wouldn't be using the space otherwise? What's the most it's going to cost you on a Tuesday night to allow someone to have a meeting space there? It might cost you a person to cover the you know, security in the space. That's an opportunity for good PR. And it also might be outreach to a number of people who hadn't recognized your business as a safe space or as a possible partnership before. Create those reciprocal relationships where it is giving back and forth. There's a great tool out there called Caro, and that's Help a Reporter Out. You can find opportunities for stories there and explain to them why you're a fit because they aren't necessarily thinking of you, but you could be giving them story ideas that they just simply need. Ultimately, that's what PR does and that's what PR professionals are doing so well, is they're helping write stories for reporters. Because could you think, I mean, I'm, I'm a writer and sometimes I simply can't think of a good idea. What they want incoming is, hey, we have a great story. We are a family owned winery that's doing this really cool, amazing thing with such and such a partnership, local organization. And here's the heart story that you're gonna love. Great, you just saved me four hours in research and ideation. And this is pretty much done. I just need to call somebody and get the details so I can make it 400 words. Fantastic. And on this tool, what you see is essentially all of those reporters asking for that help. <laughs> Reviews, if you're not already, ask for reviews. And put a focus on those diverse customers. If there's someone in your space, or if there's someone who is shopping with you that's diverse, it's saying, hey, you know what? Give us a, give us a review on Yelp. We're so happy you loved it today. Let Yelp know how you felt about it. Most of those review sites have a, an image of the person who's writing the review there. And so when people who look like that customer are looking at reviews, they'll recognize that other people who look like them have really good experiences in your business. That's a great one. Reward employees with really good reviews. Anytime an employee is explicitly named in a good review, man, amplify that, show them off, give them you know, a $50 gift certificate or whatever it is, and that will, incentivize your employees to ask for those good reviews and then amplify good social reviews. If you get a great review that is like amazing, screenshot it, throw that up in your Instagram stories, show everybody 
how good you're doing. That also reminds other people who are having great experiences to go ahead and do the same thing. And then create, create, create. Now this is the hard part because who has the time to create? <laughs> Nobody. But some of that ideation and creating can be really fun. One place I really think that's un underutilized is podcasts. Oftentimes you can be very specific um, about where, uh, where the listeners are for podcasts. A lot of times they're specifically regional. If you know that you are looking to gain your exposure within a region, reaching out to podcasts that are super uh, popular in that area. Oftentimes podcasts are super cheap too. Um, I hope that's a, a, big, uh, a big ding, ding, ding for everybody. Oftentimes it might be an exchange of content for gifts. Um, if you're doing something like that, if you are doing sort of like local TV, if you have a good morning kind of a show or that late morning show, you know, there's like the, there's the new show with the traffic from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And then there's that like little tweener weird show that happens between nine and noon where they're just talking about God knows what. They still have a bunch of eyes on them and they have to come up with something to tell everybody about <laughs> and to have content every day. Reaching out to them and saying, hey, we're doing this cool event. We'd love to tell you about it. We have the, um, you know, we have a top six lobster roll on the West Coast. Like that is a random, like nobody has the top six anything um, unless you're number six. But that's a segment where you go on, a chef is now making your amazing lobster roll, giving everybody tips for having fresh seafood in your area, blah, 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 blah. Now you've got 10 minutes of local airtime that you can reuse that content forever. And you've done them a favor and that's a reciprocal relationship. Newsflash, if you do that and bring food for everybody on set that day, 10 of those people are gonna post about it on their social media, which is also super, super helpful and great content. And then share all the content we're sharing. Reach out to those diverse creators and let everybody know that you've got the good stuff and that you want, you're wanting to work with them. Woo! Questions? Nothing? Come on, somebody's got something. What are you guys working on these days that would be helpful to talk about? Anybody got something? I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, and I handle the social media, obviously, at the winery where I work. So it's always a question of how, I guess, once you start, like, okay, Juneteenth, we didn't post anything in the feed, but we shared stories. Napa Valley Vintners did a great campaign with, um, with a uncultured and uncorked and cultured, which is um, they had black wine lovers who were in. And so we shared a lot of their stories and then we, we always share things and stories. But when it comes to the feed, which people will see more of, at what point, because I think once you start doing something, then you stop like someone said, oh, did you post for Pride Month? Did you post for Juneteenth? You know, what are you doing for Hispanic Heritage Month? It's like your entire feed could become something. Mm -hmm. And at what point, and, and then once you start, if you don't continue, you're going to offend other people. And so I'm always at a, um, you know, there's a quandary. Okay, what am I going to do? And, and because you have to make sure if you acknowledge one group, you acknowledge every group. Mm -hmm. So one thing I would do would be to, um, you can, you can save things that you post on your stories as those, now I'm not gonna remember what they're called, uh, as those, uh, you can save them at the top of your feed and you can sort of like categorize them yeah. as events or- Right, yeah, events. I know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little circle. Because a lot of yeah. brands, what they choose to do is to only post evergreen content Meaning that no matter when you look at it, if it's in your feeds, yes, highlights. Thank you, Melanie. Um, you can yes, save those in highlights. And it might be, um, 
events we support or our support. It could be under a pretty benign sort of title and you mm -hmm. save those things there because you do want to show that you do have that ongoing, but it's it, once you start, it is a part of your calendar. And so you are then paying attention to it. Um, I prefer it to stay there so that your branded content and evergreen content, meaning that any time of the year that someone looks at your feed, um, it's topical to them. Um, unless of course it is, uh, my suggestion is sort of Jenny Payne is one that I work on. If it's something that you sort of hits you in the gut that we have to say something, then maybe you say something in uh, your feed versus in your stories. Yeah, that's a great idea for to use highlights for that. Thank you. Yeah, so that because oftentimes what's also going to happen is this comes into the being prepared when people have something to say <laughs> is when you do post, somebody's going to go, oh, but you didn't. And it's like, hey, we started the it's OK to respond. You know, the paradigms have shifted. We started posting with such and such, you know, with Juneteenth, we were moved to make it. We made a decision as a brand to start commenting and social justice and historical months. And we'll definitely, we have Hispanic heritage coming up and we'll definitely have something to post and we'll be celebrating that as well because somebody's got something to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that's great. I hadn't thought about putting it in highlights. So great, thank you. And then that's also your backup when they go, well, you've never posted about this. Yes, I did. It's in my highlights, leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah, and it's great that you can go back through all of your stories that there's, you know, Instagram does archive everything. So yeah. that's great. Anything else? Any other questions for Tari? Oh my gosh. Well, I thought that presentation was absolutely fabulous. I think it covered off on a lot of topics and kind of gave us some really good insight on to, you know, how to, you know, be mindful and be uh, proactive and thoughtful. So yeah. fantastic information. Uh, Mayor Dunbar, I see that you have a question. Yeah, I tried to get through without commenting, but you know, it's impossible for me, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And it, this is really, uh, it's critically important that we keep having the conversation. Um, do you, uh, Tara, do you see the, the landscape has changed uh, because of the pandemic and how, and I'm trying to look at this from a business perspective, uh, we need to engage people differently than we did a year and a half ago. And there is an awareness about DEI, certainly more than a year and a half ago, but also it's about how are we recapturing and capturing new um patrons. And so just purely from a business standpoint, do we need to be sharing different messages uh, or how do we not only recover, but build from the old uh, outreach and the old business engagement, given the current situation? One, um, and thank you for your question, Mayor Dunbar. Uh, one, I really like brands who are explicit that they are learning and changing. So I think it's okay to say, um, we recognize this is a space where we have learning and growing to do, and we're working on it. Um, I think that transparency is really important. I also think that, yes, I think that the way you interact with different groups is super important. It's not just showing them, you know, in imagery, but ensuring that they're going to be welcome when they get there. Right now, also, travel is, it is like the roaring 20s. Everybody has been stuck in the house uh, and looking for a way to get out. And Hawaii is really expensive and super packed. So they're going a little closer, you know, and hopefully Yonville reaps the benefits of that. So it's, hey, we're here too. And being explicit about that messaging that we're here, we recognize, and we're looking to make sure you have the best time available here. So I think that the messaging definitely does change for sure. Yeah, great question and, and really good point. And I know a lot of our businesses are at capacity. 
Uh, but that's that's not going to be forever. So thinking about kind of that continue to have that base layer of marketing and then going above and beyond, you know, once we get to the Cabernet season and, and the winter time. So definitely a good question. Excellent. Um, any other thoughts or comments, uh, questions for Tari before we wrap up? Any hurdles that anyone has? I'm happy to talk the hard stuff too. you. <laughs> No. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Tari, thank you so much for joining us today. It truly was a pleasure. And your presentations are always so insightful, yet the perfect length, which, uh, you know, hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed that as well. So try to be mindful about time. So thank you so much. And hopefully we'll have you out here in person uh, very soon. And we'll do one of these uh, all together and maybe have a little wine. Um, and thank you for agreeing to share your slides and we'll send that out to the group. And like I mentioned, this recording will be on our YouTube channel so you can access it there and share it with your friends or coworkers. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Our next all member meeting is on July 21st at 10 a.m. And that is uh, available on our website to register. So Tari, thank you so much. Thank you, have a wonderful day. All right, we'll see you all later. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.